After I completed my MBA at London Business School, I joined a strategy consulting firm. And I loved the work, um, and I hated the lifestyle, but I loved the firm. And after I'd been there a few months, the managing partner announced that the partnership had voted to sell the company and to merge with another consulting firm. And all of us, sort of the troops, trying to work on the ground and deliver value to the clients, really, really struggled with this. Because frankly, we had no idea how we were going to deliver on the promises the partners had made of, for strategic opportunities. And it became increasingly clear that neither did the partners have any idea how we were going to do it. And I remember working late in the office one Sunday evening on a particular project, sort of struggling to make sense of my brief. And I looked across at a, at a friend of mine who was working on another project, working beside me. And um, I told him, look, I'm, I'm going to go now. It's midnight. I'm tired. I, I have to get some sleep. And he said, well, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay all night if I have to, to try and work out what exactly it is I'm supposed to be doing. And at that point, he broke down and started crying. And as I held him in my arms and tried to comfort him, I felt so overwhelmingly angry with the partners of the firm for their negligence, for their incompetence in having brought about this deal without any consideration about the impact it would have on the people within the firm or how to deliver on the promises they had made. This anger prompted me to resign and to go back to London Business School to begin a PhD in mergers between professional service firms. <laughs> and throughout that time, I've always remained focused on this friend of mine. And I've dedicated the past 25 years to trying to make sense of the complex, the confusing, and the fascinating dynamics that take place within these organisations. And I'm passionately committed to helping leaders create environments in which professionals can thrive and be successful. Let's talk about leadership and power. Now, here's a quotation from one of my research interviews with a client relationship partner in an elite professional services firm. So I ask him, does anyone have power over you? And he replies, not as far as I'm concerned, no. Does anyone think they have power over you? I don't think so. <laughs> so I was really intrigued by this. I thought, how do you actually lead someone like this? Here's what a senior partner says. It's not about telling them what to do. It's actually just coming up with the prompts and ideas to maximize the business and get the best out of people. So leadership sort of happens. If you talk to one of the more rank-and-file partners in another organization, the response is, it's not about following in that sense. It's about leaders enabling and directing, giving people outlets, because frankly, nobody has to follow anyone. So how does this work? These are elite organizations where leadership sort of happens and no one is following. The answer is to think about power. Power in professional firms is in all aspects of life, belongs to people who control access to key resources. And in professional service firms, the key resources are valuable client relationships, specialist technical expertise, and a strong reputation in the marketplace. And the people who control these, the successful senior partners, are enormously powerful. They have enormous informal power in these firms, even if they have no formal authority. But crucially, they don't use that power to control others. They use it to resist others' ability to control them. Mm. Professionals want autonomy, but they recognize that some control needs to be imposed on their colleagues. So powerful <laughs> professionals, in effect, delegate formal authority to their colleagues to lead the organization on their behalf but they can withdraw that authority at any time, either formally by deposing the senior leadership, which happens surprisingly often, or informally by simply ignoring them, which happens all the time. So at the heart of, these, of leadership in professional organizations is this paradoxical tension between extensive autonomy for individual professionals and contingent authority for those who attempt to lead them. And they sit at all time in this, this tense, resistance. 
Now, one of the foundations of my research is the concept of the leadership constellation, which I developed to try and make sense of what I was observing. And this expresses the informal power structure within an organization, what's behind the organogram, the reality of how things actually work. And at the heart of it, you have the leadership dyad, the senior partner and the managing partner, or maybe the chairman and the chief executive, the two people most involved in leading the organization. And sitting around them, are a number of individuals, selected business heads, just a few, the most powerful ones, the most influential ones, selected management professionals, maybe the COO and the CFO, possibly the head of HR, but not necessarily. But look at the one the group at the bottom, the key influencers, because these people may not appear on an organization chart at all. They have no formal titles often, but they are incredibly influential because they have a significant following within the organization. And around them, the power sort of radiates out. It's vital that the leaders retain the support of these key influences. So I, I set out in the firms I was studying to map the leadership constellation. I just want to show you here what one of those maps looks like. I'm not going to explain it all to you, don't worry. But basically I went round and I asked everybody who said that they were involved in the leadership team and I got them to talk about their position and to rank themselves relative to other people. And I studied a few key decision processes to see who was involved and at what stage did they get involved. And from that I developed this map. And the point to notice is that the people on the outside of this grey circle believe they're running the firm and are totally unaware that there is an inner circle within that of people who are actually running the firm. So in an organisation like that, how does leadership actually happen? So this is where the politics comes in. If you think about that leader I quoted earlier who said that leadership sort of happens, and that the professionals who say that frankly nobody has to follow anybody. Professionals are often very reluctant to characterise themselves as leaders and even more reluctant to accept the role of follower. So we need to conceptualise leadership and followership in a very different way. And what I'm going to be talking about here is a plural model of leadership. So rather than think of leadership that's something that an individual does to their followers, it's something that is collectively constructed by peers working together in interaction. And this is the essence of leadership in professional service firms. But it's tricky to work out how it actually works because it is amorphous and nuanced and subtle. And I spent a lot of time analysing data from multiple organisations to build this model, which I'm going to take you through briefly. How do you go about co-constructing leadership amongst professional peers? Well, there are three core elements to it. The process of legitimising, the process of negotiating, and the tension that sits within that. But I want to focus in on the third one, manoeuvring, because that's where the politics comes in. Manoeuvring, how the leaders go about acting politically whilst their colleagues, whilst their peers, are perceiving them as having integrity. Now, it's important to emphasise that I never explicitly asked a question about politics in my research interviews, but people kept telling me about politics, and specifically what they were telling me was that politics wasn't happening in their organisation and that they themselves weren't political, and if anyone did come across as overtly political, they were punished and, and basically drummed out of the firm. But as I rapidly discovered, this is just completely wrong. Professionals have a very, very naive conceptualisation of what politics is. Politics is absolutely rife within these firms. It is the lifeblood of these firms. It's how they get anything done. Let me take you through this quote. It's quite a long quote, but it's an elegant one. This is coming from a board member of an elite professional firm. I think the political types in this firm are playing too many games, getting too clever for their own good, constantly thinking about tactics. But actually, I do that all of the time. My last transaction, there were seven different stakeholder groups, all with complex demands, all wanting their own way, and my job was to get everybody across the line without them punching each other. I'm really good at working out strategically how to move things forward. This is starting to sound like politics to me. I feel passionately about the firm, and I think there's a difference between me and the real political game players here who are not always doing it for the common good. The reason I believe this is a very naive conceptualisation of politics is because they don't recognise that if you rise to the top of the firm, if you end up as a board member, it's you who gets to decide what the common good is. 
In professional organisations, political behaviour isn't inherently bad. It's simply how you get things done. A leader needs to build and sustain consensus amongst his or her colleagues to make trade-offs with competing interest groups and to offer incentives to people to persuade them to lend their support for particular initiatives. So to succeed in an environment like this, the leaders need to have very astute political skills. And there's been an extensive body of research on political skills, which has identified some of the key elements that le successful leaders need to have. But I want to focus on one in particular here, apparent sincerity. Now, apparent sincerity <laughs> doesn't mean that politically skilled leaders are not sincere, just that they are able to persuade their colleagues that they are. And I can't climb inside someone's heart and work out whether they're being sincere or not. All that matters in this context is that the people they're trying to influence believe that they are sincere. So here's an example of a quote describing a leader who's done this very effectively. The senior partner doesn't necessarily always understand how influential he is. He's very modest about it quite self-effacing, and he himself doesn't attach such great importance to some of those things that might be under the heading of creeping, as in slightly sinister. He is not himself a player in that way at all. It's simply because his own motivations in this world are so, I think, very genuine and clean. So I am intrigued, how can someone rise to the very top of one of the largest, most elite professional firms in his sector, without being a player. I mean, do we believe this? Of course not. But the point is, the people within his organization perceive that he is working for the common good. So to go back to the model, these political skills are necessary not just to achieve and exercise power, but to retain it. Remember, leadership in professional organizations results from this complex and nuanced, subtle set of interactions between these various dynamics. And therefore, it's inherently unstable. It is an unstable equilibrium. And at any point, the relations between these various dynamics can break down. And it ultimately explains why leading professional services firms is so incredibly difficult and so absolutely fascinating to study. The final point, the prima donnas. The so-called prima donnas, I put them in quotes. Now, anyone who's worked in a professional service firm knows the kind of person I'm talking about, and I suspect there may even be some in the room. Welcome if you're here. Um, let me tell you what it really means, okay? And here's, we turn to the Oxford English Dictionary. Now, we're very focused on the second part of the definition, a self-important and temperamental person, but let's look at the first part a person of great skill and renown who takes a leading role in a particular community or field. These people, these prima donnas, are seen as role models in their firm, so we shouldn't simply dismiss them. We need to understand better what's driving their behaviour. And I would contend, and indeed my research shows, that an important element of it is going to be insecurity. As with politics, I never explicitly asked about insecurity, but interviewees were very, very keen, remarkably keen, to tell me that they were insecure, and even if they weren't insecure, the people they worked with were. As one practice head confessed to me, I just come in here and work as hard as I can all the time. We all tend to be such insecure people that we're all scared all of the time. I mean, just look at that quote. This person is going to be taking home over a million a year in, in their early 50s, absolutely at the top of their profession, looked up from within the firm and from outside the firm, beloved of their clients. We are all scared all of the time. An extraordinary thing for someone to choose to volunteer to tell me. And in case you just think this is an aberration, here is a comment from a managing partner. Our partners are looking for reassurance all of the time. It's ridiculous. Some of the partners who are most clearly insecure are some of the very best people we have. So it's worth asking, why are they so insecure? And I know people think it's just funny, but it's not. It's incredibly sad. Let's look behind it. There are th three broad factors. First of all, you've got to understand the nature of professional work. And it stems from the inherent ambiguity both of inputs and of outputs. How do you persuade your client that you know something worth knowing? How do you persuade the client that you have delivered something worth having? Well, one of the ways you do it is at all times by maintaining a very confident demeanor that looks like you genuinely are worth a thousand pounds an hour. 
And that puts a lot of strain on people. To be promoted in these organisations, you have to survive a very rigorous up or out procedure. So if you don't make the grade, you are not allowed to stay. And once you're raised to a position of leadership, you need to keep winning the work anyway to retain your legitimacy. So the inherent insecurity of professional work is amplified by the nature of the organisational structure. But there's a third element here, the individual element, the insecure overachiever. Now, the insecure overachiever is typically an exceptionally capable individual, phenomenally driven by a profound sense of their own inadequacy. Now, for some people, it will be as a, come from financial hardship experienced early in life or some kind of major physical disruption that gives them an intense sense of insecurity. For others, it's going to have its roots in their parenting. If they felt that they would only receive the attention and love from their parents, if they would only be valued by their parents when they were doing exceptionally well. The point is not that these people exist. We kind of know that. The point is that professional services firms deliberately target these individuals, go out, seek them out at the recruitment process, and bring them into the organisation. And it's that that is the really intriguing part. Because once they bring them into the firm, they exacerbate the circumstances likely to increase their insecurity. I first came across the concept of the insecure overachiever um, in, during my PhD, so it's 25 years ago. And it was the head of HR of a major global accounting firm who told me how they deliberately profile these kinds of individuals on the milk ground, how they set out to recruit them. When they, when they join, they tell them, you have joined the very, very best firm in the business, and that means you're special. And she said, once we've done that, we've basically got them for as long as we want them because they will be so worried about leaving that they will do anything we ask of them. The interesting question is why don't the insecure overachievers realise what's being done to them? And there you need to understand how the professional firms deliberately set out to create these environments of social control. And it starts really early. When I was going through the interview process, I thought, this place seems like a cult, but now I've been here for a while, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> Here's someone else from another firm. I really became a robot. I thought it was normal. My husband, my parents, my friends asked me, are you crazy? And I replied, no, it's normal. It's like brainwashing. You say to yourself that it doesn't matter, that you'll rest afterwards, but that moment never comes. And the bit that intrigues me most about this is that these people who are caught up in this dynamic believe themselves to be acting autonomously. They believe that they are exercising conscious choice to behave in this way. They don't acknowledge the extent to which they're being controlled by the firm. The quote I'm going to give you here is a rare example of reflexivity in a senior professional. As a partner, I have a huge amount of personal independence. No one tells me what to do. I do what I want. But the things I want are likely to help the firm because that's the way I've been trained. At one level, we're completely independent, but we all march to the same tune without even thinking about it. So by the time they become leaders, they are unconsciously replicating that social control. They have been so socialised into it, they cannot think independently about it. They will continue to create it over and over and again within each generation. So what? Should we care? If we're not one of these people, why should we care? Well, I think it has direct, broader consequences at an economic and social level. Because when you have this kind of collective groupthink in these organisations, you start to see the kind of ethical scandals and financial collapses that are becoming increasingly familiar within this sector. You're left thinking, why do smart people do such stupid things? And we can start to see some of the explanations in the dynamics that are being created within these organisations. At a personal level, it's wonderful to see current MBAs in the room right now, hello. If you're thinking about your future and the jobs that you want to do, be very, very sensitive in, during the recruitment process to how these firms are sending you signals and seeking to manipulate you. I'm not saying don't join these firms. If you get an offer from Goldman Sachs or McKinsey, you know, congratulations, I'll be as happy for you as anybody. But understand what you're going into so that you can step back from it and make conscious choices and not become like that person who described themselves as a robot. 
More generally, at a personal level, I think we can understand, and there's increasingly being publicized, the extent of physical and mental breakdown, the mental health issues that are coming out of the closet, in a sense. It's the last great taboo to be able to admit that you have these issues, that you're somehow not quite coping. I think it is important that we need to understand that if you allow people's whole sense of self-worth to be bound up with the work they do and how hard they work, they will inevitably risk driving themselves to the point of destruction. And I think it's fair for us to stay, step back and just think, is this a good idea? So I would encourage people to be reflexive. I was talking earlier about the MBAs being reflexive about thinking what's driving them. The leaders of the organisations too, thinking, you know, if you are 30 years into this profession and earning far more money than you really know what to do with, why are you still getting up at five in the morning? Why are you still checking your emails after midnight? What is it about? And ask yourself, are you setting a good precedent? Are you being an effective role model within your organisation? You know, my book has not set out to provide the answers because there are no simple answers to questions of leadership. Instead, I want to help you to work out how to ask better questions and to see familiar phenomenon with greater clarity and to think more rigorously about how to discover your answers for yourself, to keep asking those questions. I'm hoping this book is going to challenge some of your assumptions, inspire you to develop insights of your own, and encourage you to bring these insights to fruition. So whether you're a student, you're an academic, or a professional, this is where leadership begins. Thank you very much.